data science, data analytics, machine learning, data science using Python, machine learning using R. These are some of the words that are thrown around. For someone who is absolutely new to this space, this all looks very confusing. There are plenty of videos, articles and job descriptions out there, but a common problem that everyone faces is where to start. That is why I am here to help. I am happy that you have enrolled in this course. I will be the instructor of this course, so please allow me to introduce myself to you. My name is Rakesh. In my day job, I am a coder and an analytics manager. And in my spare time, I like to solve puzzles, hiking, playing Xbox, photography, and above all, learning and teaching databases. I have my own website where I frequently upload articles and blogs. I would encourage you to visit the website if you are interested in reading more and sign up for my newsletter as well. I designed this course as a part of the business intelligent intelligence suite. So if you are a data analyst or looking for a career switch in the field of data analytics, this course is for you. In my BI suite of courses, I have covered topics catering to different audiences. The courses are aimed in order for you to learn the topics so that you may apply them in various job titles like a data analyst, reporting analyst, business analyst, SQL developer, BI developer, ETL developer, data scientist, etc. To get a comprehensive overview of all these courses and job titles and what is generally expected of interviews, please refer the article I have written for which I have provided a link in the reading section as well. So essentially, a typical BI stack consists of the following. It has databases and querying concepts. It has transferring and manipulating data from different sources. It has um, tools for visualizing the data. And then finally, what we'll be covering in this course particularly is predict and prediction, predicting and pattern analyzing the data. So for all the above four, I have recorded videos. So depending upon what role you're applying for um, in order to make a career on, I would suggest to take up that respective course first or all the courses in the BI suite. Next, I designed this course keeping in mind some of the feedback I have received previously. If you have taken any of my previous courses, you might have seen that I don't really assume that students have any prior knowledge to the technology. I keep slides to a minimum and explain all the steps by showing them how to do them. I will be maintaining the same in this course as well. In fact, I will try to avoid using any slides. Instead, I will upload this PDF with the course itself. Now, having said that, since data science is such a vast topic and uh, even I am personally learning it on day to day basis, learning new things, I would strongly recommend you to please read the articles and other additional reading materials um, that I will be providing in the additional sections. This is just because this area is so vast that I won't be really be able to cover each and every concept. But what I'll do is at least I will cover all the important concepts that can help you get started. Finally, I would like to say that at the time of recording this course, more than 150,000 people have already enrolled and taken my previous courses. So thank you so much for all the encouragement, questions, feedback and suggestions. All right, so let's agree on some ground rules. Since some of the concepts may not be new for you, please feel free to skip to the next lesson if you feel so. If you feel that a concept is going a little fast for you, I would encourage you to rewind and watch this lecture again. Remember, no question is a dumb question. Feel free to ask questions in the forums. We are here to help. Finally, many people have asked me to add some reading resources. I will upload this document as a PDF and also add some useful resources as additional reference. Hope you like the course. So, see you in the next lecture. Welcome back to chapter number two on data science using Python. Firstly, before I start, I want to let you know that there are no prerequisites for this course. I will show you step by step and furnish all information and reading materials that is necessary for this course. So what exactly will we cover and what is machine learning? 
So machine learning is a field of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So say for instance, you have a set of data and you're trying to derive some knowledge out of it or test some hypothesis over the data. So there are lots of predefined algorithms that help you to do that. Precisely, that's what we call it as machine learning. So don't worry too much at this time as we will start looking at some examples and things will become more and more clear. So consider this little diagram, right? So what does this diagram really tell us? So if you look at a machine learning perspective from, um, you know, say a 50,000 feet view, all it is is just some input data that we supply to an algorithm and the output is a few predictions or, or a few patterns, right? So it's as simple as that. But let's take a step back. So what are these algorithms that we talked about? So do I have to like invent any algorithm that can churn through my input data? The answer is no. These algorithms are already been written for you. All you need to do is supply some of the input data to it and these output out and these algorithms will output the patterns and predictions. All right, so exactly like, you know, what is the catch? Well, there's no catch as such, but if you think about it, there are two main aspects in this whole equation. One is choosing your inputs and second is choosing your algorithms. This is where the actual skill sets and domain knowledge comes into play. So for algorithms to work effectively, it is essential that your inputs are clean and relevant. I will reiterate that your inputs should be relevant to your algorithm. Cleaning and manipulation of inputs play a very major role in the performance of your algorithms. So if your input has about say a thousand rows, the algorithm may or may not work effectively. In this course, we will exactly learn how to choose these inputs and how to clean the input and make it relevant so that we can feed that to the algorithm more effectively and so that the algorithm can provide you with the correct results. We will also learn how to choose the correct algorithm and package this all together. So Python provides some methods and techniques that helps you choose which columns from your inputs would be more effective for the algorithm to perform at its peak. So once you have correctly chosen your inputs, it is now time to choose the correct algorithm. Now there are plenty and plenty of machine learning algorithms out there and we need an effective way to choose which algorithm will work best with a given set of inputs. So in the coming lectures, we will be precisely looking at those things. That is how to clean up your data, how to choose your input and how to choose the most effective and optimal algorithm that can work against your input data and produce the output and most accurate predictions. Now, at a high level, there are various types of algorithms as well as, um, you know, we will we, we'll kind of even look at these uh, algorithms one by one. Um, we'll also see how different combinations of the columns as inputs can provide drastically different predictions and different patterns. So to summarize, machine learning is nothing but supplying some inputs to an algorithm and churning through that input to output a pattern or a prediction. So your algorithm will be only as much accurate as your input data is and the algorithm that you have chosen in order to work on that input data. All right, so once this concept is a little clear on your mind at a very high level, let us go one step deeper. I keep talking about these algorithms. So what are actually these algorithms and how many algorithms are out there? So at a very high level, Machine learning algorithms can be broadly classified into two types. One is called supervised learning and another is called unsupervised learning. So supervised learning is nothing but you have the input data and you have the output data and you supply both of them to the algorithm and let the algorithm study the patterns in the data. So that in future, if there is a similar input that arrives, the algorithm can actually kind of predict or try to predict the output, right? 
so let's let's look at this this particular diagram right and then this is basically a machine learning problem which is called email spam classification right so uh, think about your normal gmail or any other email program that you're using um, you know google intelligently classifies all your emails into non-spam and spam so naturally what it is doing is it is taking the input your email um, message as the input passing it to an algorithm and the algorithm is actually telling Google that, hey, this is a spam message and this is not a spam message, right? And it's quite accurate if you if you kind of look at your spam inbox, you can see how accurate it is, right? So how does this really work? So you can feed the following input, that is emails, um, into the supervised learning algorithm and let it study, right? So let us say this is your input, right? So if you see, um, you know, this is where the overall trick of domain knowledge and, and using correct input data comes into play. Your input, if you think about it, is just a simple text message, right? An email message. And what we have done is we have kind of broken that a little bit, right? From that email message, we have taken some text. We have taken the from address. We have taken the to address. We have seen how many spelling errors are there in the email address. We have seen how many external links are there. And then we have classified it as yes or no, spam yes or no, right? So this is basically your input and output data that you will be supplying to the algorithm. So if next time, if a similar input comes, it can try to predict whether it's a spam or not, right? So th that is why this whole concept of, um, you know, input um, algorithms, um, the way the data is cleaned up as input and, and, and the way that it needs to be supplied to an algorithm is very, very important. So I hope you're getting the message so far, right? Supervised learning is nothing but algorithms wherein you provide the inputs and also provide the outputs and let the algorithm study the relationship between the two, right? And then uh, also the patterns between the two. So in future, if a similar input comes um, in a similar pattern, hopefully the algorithm would be able to predict the output. So there you go. You now know what at least one type that, you know, at least one type of machine learning algorithms. And there are various algorithms and supervised machine learning as well, which we will look in the coming lectures. So the goal of this lecture was to give you a very high level view of what exactly is machine learning and what are the types of machine learning. All right, so moving on, the next one is unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning is kind of the little opposite of uh, supervised learning, right? So in supervised learning, we had inputs and we had also the outputs that we supplied to the algorithm and established a pattern. However, in unsupervised learning, we don't have any output. So the algorithm will just study the inputs and then classify them according to certain categories or clusters. So don't worry too much about it right now. We'll look at a very practical example in the in the coming lectures. All right, so there we are. We now know what is machine learning. It is nothing but providing set of inputs to an algorithm and deriving some knowledge out of that. And in this whole process, there are a lot of algorithms that help us do that. And these, these algorithms, um, you know, work on text data and there are specialized algorithms that work on numerical data. Um, some algorithms can work on videos, pictures, etc. So in the next lecture, we will take a deeper dive. We will look at some tools which will help us do this. We'll look at some packages in Python which will kind of help us, um, you know, run some of the algorithms. So we'll take it one step further and see what, what's in it for us. Thank you. Hey guys, welcome back. In the previous chapter, we learned what is machine learning, what are the input data that we supply to it, and how do we use that input data to supply to some sort of an algorithm that goes through the data and either produces a pattern or categorizes into certain categories. Please remember this very simple framework throughout. That is, you have input data supplied to an algorithm and the algorithm basically outputs a predicted value or a pattern. Now, this is a very high level 50,000 view of what is machine learning. Now, in this lecture, we are going to look at how to set up some tools that help you run some machine learning algorithms. We will be using Python and in Python, we will be using a statistical package called 
scikit learn all right so what is python um python is simply a programming language right so you must have heard about programming languages like java c sharp and others now python is simply another programming language that is very simple to learn and has very readable and clean syntax now believe me if you are new to python you will enjoy learning this uh, particular programming language now let me be very clear that the goal of this course is not to learn python from scratch right i will provide you with some resources that you can use to get acquainted with python i will make every attempt to explain the context as and when we go through this course so if i use a particular keyword or a particular line of code in python um for data modeling and machine learning um i will try to explain what those objects and you know all those keywords stand for now if you are completely new to programming you might find some of the concepts a bit overwhelming now if that happens i would suggest you to hang in there and keep web searching or reading the materials on python that i will be providing now since this is not a python specific course you are expected to do some additional reading if some of the syntax on python or concepts are not clear to you please pause the video and definitely read up or ask your questions in the forums all right so when you work with programming languages like java or c sharp you have also heard about tools like say eclipse netbeans visual studio now these are all called as integrated development environments or ides now these things in a lot of ways make your programming very very easy similarly python also has many tools now we will be using some of them as and when we uh, move further along the course we will be using uh, the anaconda distribution of python i will be showing you how to set up that environment and also i'll be showing you how to write your first line of code now what is scikit learn right so scikit learn is a package or a library for python which helps you to clean up the inputs and helps you supply them to the algorithm in short the statistical package also called as scikit learn helps you design machine learning models very easily without writing too much code now i have given some documentation as well i would recommend you to just skim through these materials so that you know you are actually aware of what we are talking about so we'll definitely go through things like numpy arrays and all all those things but definitely just to um, you know get acquainted with this um, have a glance through this and look at the documentation as well so that you know what we are talking about now i will also show you how to install this whole scikit learn packages or library and write your first line of code after you have set up all your environments correctly we can then look at what are the different algorithms or machine learning algorithms available and what are the ways in which you can clean up your inputs and then apply machine learning con machine learning concepts or techniques in order to model the data in order to go ahead and get started i would say um, definitely download the anaconda distribution so i have given the link and definitely uh, go ahead and install it it's it's pretty straightforward exe just keep clicking next and install it um so that in the next lecture i can i can kind of walk you through some of the basic syntax some of the basic code that you can start writing so we are pretty much there in order to start our whole journey uh, and start writing code, some some amount of code so go ahead and install this and i'm sure you'll enjoy the remaining part of the course as well thank you all right so now we have discussed what is machine learning we have also discussed what are the components that are required for a machine learning problem we looked at inputs getting supplied to an algorithm which outputs either a pattern or a prediction now this is a sentence that i will keep repeating and keep showing you more in terms of diagrams and pictorial pictorial representations because it becomes more simpler for you to apply if you uh, kind of think in that way so this is what is machine learning all about then we also looked at what are the tools that we can use for machine learning we particularly discussed installing a python distribution called anaconda 
And before we go ahead and actually start writing some code and start looking at some example, let's go one level deep into these algorithms that we have been referring to. So I will go ahead and show you what these algorithms are comprised of. However, my, my main intention of this course is not to go deep into statistics. Right. So maybe I'll, I'll devote a separate course for it. I will, however, be providing you with some additional reading materials in case you are interested in learning more about actual statistical concepts. All right. So without thinking too much, right, if we just look at this particular diagram, what we see is four main words that stick out, right? One is classification, one is regression, the third one is clustering. And finally, we have dimensionality reduction. So this is a very high level way in which all the machine learning algorithms are categorized. So depending upon what problem you are trying to solve, we will choose one or more algorithms that belong to these categories. So you see words like samples greater than 50, then you have category, more data and so on and so forth, right? So we will keep revisiting this diagram as we move forward. Now, Let's take a very simple data set. So your problem, your problem statement is use machine learning to predict profits per sale, right? So now we are trying to introduce a little bit more nomenclature into this, right? So we're going to call these inputs as features. Okay. Now let's assume that your input looks something like this. Very, very simple, right? So you have sales. It says $30, $40, $50, $70, and you have the corresponding profit, which is $3, $4, $5, and $7, right? And sales, we are going to, you know, maybe uh, call it as uppercase X and profit as lowercase Y. Now, don't worry about why I'm calling it uppercase X and lowercase Y. We will cover that in detail in the next lecture. Right. So now just just imagine that, you know, you have this input and output and like we have been discussing um, in all our lectures, we are going to give this to an algorithm, this whole table and let it study the patterns. Right. So that if a similar input comes in the future, it can predict that output. Right. So how how will this look like? So if you supply to this to machine learning, it will output Y. Actually, this should be small y y is equal to 0.1 times x, right? It's, 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 it's very simple, right? So if you see, um, you know, 3 is 0.1 multiplied by 30, right? And this is what is machine learning, right? This is what the machine learning algorithm will do. Think about it. See, see, this is how the, the output looks like, right? 3 is nothing at 0.1 times 30, which is you know, the, the profit. Similarly, 4 is 0.1 times 40 and so on and so forth. Right. So since now you have the model, now what I mean by model is this particular equation that you see, this is the machine learning model. So when they, when you actually get a statement like fit a model, right, the model is nothing but y is equal to 0.1 times x, right. What it says is, if you actually give an input in future, any value for X, the Y value that you get is your predicted value, right? So let's look at it. So let's, let's assume that if sales, if the input was hundred, right? If sales input was hundred and no output was given, can you predict the output or can you predict the profit? Well, you can, right? Because you know that it is 0.1 times the sales. So the profit will be ten dollars right so this is this is this is what we are going to do in this whole course right what we are going to kind of look at some algorithms which can ultimately give us an equation and what we are going to do is we're going to supply some inputs to that equation and that equation is going to spit out an output right now remember i have taken a very 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 simple example right we only see one input over here in the coming lectures we will see how to take this input in Python and supply to a machine learning algorithm and look at the machine learning model output equation, however you want to call it, right? So we'll, we'll look at also how to choose an algorithm and how to deal with multiple inputs. You have just one input here, then there could, it's, it's, 
in most of the machine learning problems that you will get, you will get multiple inputs, right? And we'll also look at some techniques on how, how to evaluate if your predictions are indeed correct or not, right? Um, you know, there is, there is plenty of ways in which you can do that. We will study that. We'll take little part of our, um, you know, given set of data, train it, and then, you know, try the same into predictions and see how close it is to, you know, our actual value. So we don't, don't worry too much about it. We'll, we'll take that step by step. So having said that, below are some of the commonly used machine learning algorithms. So if you are a starter, this might be a little bit overwhelming. But if you remember, I promised that we've been always dealing with some inputs going to an algorithm. We looked at what are the categorizations of these algorithms. We looked at those four categories and now we're looking at actual algorithms, right? So um, again, if you're a starter, I would suggest start with some simple example inputs, see what output you get from these algorithms, then decide which algorithm gives you close to the correct prediction. Remember, machine learning is not magic. It's just simple statistics. Your algorithm's correctness and output will highly depend on your inputs. The trick in machine learning is to choose the correct set of inputs and supply to the correct machine learning algorithm, which will give you as close as possible to the correct prediction or the correct result, right? So these are the two main, um, you know, categories that we discussed. And um, supervised is nothing but you supply input and output to the algorithm and let the algorithm study the patterns or, you know, the relationships between the two so that if a similar input comes in the future, it can actually classify or categorize and predict the output based on what it studied before. So commonly used are your linear regression, logistic regression, we have classification, um, decision trees, and so on and so forth, right? Then we have a couple of unsupervised algorithms as well. Uh, again, don't, don't uh, worry too much about it. For now, uh, we, will, we will take a few examples, take uh, some actual data um, and use Python to actually show how to supply that to say a KNN algorithm, right? K nearest neighbor algorithm and you know, how, how can we get the output and how can we study the output? Again, we're taking it slowly, adding step by step. So please bear with me here. Um, again, uh, there are a lot of terms that I introduced in this lecture. I would uh, suggest that you do a reading of these things. And again, as I mentioned, this is not a statistics course and this is not a Python uh, from the scratch course. So you have to do some reading, uh, but I will try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, you know, I try to explain just the minimal things that would be required in order to kind of get your feet wet and, you know, get just to get started. Uh, but I would strongly suggest that you just give a, a, a brief reading about these things that I have mentioned in the additional reading. That will at least prepare you well for the next lecture. Thank you so much. All right. So welcome back. And what we are going to do in this particular video is kind of do a very quick overview of the tools that we will be using to write our first line of code. Right. So we will look at, um, you know, Anaconda distribution of Python and, and the various tools that we installed, um, you know, in the previous lectures. So let me go on and fire up Anaconda. And this is called Anaconda Navigator. And as soon as you start the tool, you will see a couple of options. Right. So this is how it looks like. So you see that by default, it, it has a couple of things on the first home screen, right? And if you see these buttons, there is either the launch option or install option. And if you have um, install option in Jupyter, go ahead and definitely click on it and install Jupyter Notebook because that is basically the primary tool that we will be using to write code, okay? Now, um, this is kind of the navigator starting point, right? This is the place from where you start launching tools. And before we go further into it, um, you know, I just wanted to walk you through some of the options available, right? So learning is, um, you know, it has a rich set of documentation, um, you know, different um, um, reference guides, tutorials, NumPy documentation, and so on and so forth. And, and you will find this to be extremely useful when we start discussing some um, concepts in data science and machine learning. 
So definitely have a look at that and 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 read a few things. Uh, there is also a good community where you can participate, and these are all forums, and you know definitely have a look at that as well. All right. So what we're going to do is right now, um, and and we'll we'll cover some of them in the oncoming lectures, but we're going to particularly focus on Jupiter. So let me go ahead and launch that. And once I do that, you will see that this opens up in your web browser. So this is a web browser based tool, right? So what I'm going to do is, uh, this is kind of just um, showing you, um, you know, your default path. You can definitely go to the navigator and change your default path. I'm going to create a folder and I'll just call that as, um, got created somewhere here, let's see. Hopefully, okay, here, this one. So I'll go ahead and just rename this and I'll call this as Python programs. Okay, so we have a folder ready and what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to go into that folder and I'm going to create a new Python 3 notebook. And as soon as I do that, it kind of launches this new tab, right? So let me just um, rename this to my first hello world program something like this all right so we do have we have launched this it, it gets launched in web browser now the cool thing is that all your interactions are going to be through this web browser and and that's a cool thing that i i like right so um and let let me show you a couple of things a couple of these options and stuff like that so Let's go ahead and first type our first line of code. I'm going to say print hello world. And what I'm going to do is if I just press the enter key, it will go to the new line. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to press control and enter and it will actually execute that line of code and output hello world, right? So definitely um, practice a few things in Python because you know we will be going a little bit faster you know um, I'll, I'll definitely explain the code and stuff like that but um, you know this is how a typical uh, python program and 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 the jupyter workbook looks like right and now um, there are a couple of other options available here and the first thing i wanted to tell you is about shortcuts right so if you press the h key it actually opens up all the jupyter shortcuts right so for instance I could just say, let's see, this one, insert cell below, and then it kind of inserts another cell, and I'm going to call this as say, hello world two. And I could just say control and enter, and it will output that. As against that, I could just press the H key, and if you see here, the letter B is the insert cell below, right? And in order to do that, there are two ways, right? So if you see, this particular cell becomes green. That means it is active right now and you're able to type. So basically if you type B, it'll actually go ahead and show the letter B and it will not actually insert a new cell. So what you should do is you should press the escape key, make it blue and now type B and then it goes ahead and, and adds a new row or adds a new cell. And the navigate between cells is pretty easy. You could just use your you know, up and down arrow keys, go to the cell, press enter, and then, you know, start modifying it, right? So this is kind of how we will be using it. Now, one cool thing about this particular notebook is that it's, it, it also, you can, you can, you can uh, type in some Python code and also you can type in some markup, right? So now what I mean by that is, let's do something like this. Oops, enter my first Python program, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to, and I'm going to change this to uh, markdown. Now, if I press control and enter, 
it will actually show this as a normal HTML or a you know markup language. So let me press enter and make some modifications, right? So I could just put this as bold, oops, and things like that. So a lot of stuff you can do. Um, you know, it's it's a combination of you can write your code as well as your programs, and pretty much if you think about it, you know, I have been using um, you know Google Docs to kind of store my uh, presentations or so-called um, notes. I could just you know do it lecture one and then put some code, lecture two some code and things like that as well. Because all I have to do is just put some markup over here and then I can I can kind of write my code as well. So I can continue writing my code. Press the button key um sorry b and then i could just you know continue with my code right so some shortcuts here that we we talked about uh definitely play around with this this is very very high level at this point but you know i'll try to be more verbal when i start typing some code definitely for the next lecture i would say read upon um what is the import statements um uh, you know what are modules what are uh, functions you know how do you import a module and things like that again we'll try to keep it simple for now before introducing more complexity but definitely read more about python or take a brief python course so that you know these things don't come in your way of learning machine learning right because that is the whole purpose of this course we're going to we're going to you know walk through some algorithms and stuff like that so we won't be too much focusing on just the python aspect Having said that, uh, I think we are ready to start, um, you know, taking some data, applying to an algorithm, watching the output, the same things that we talked about in the previous few lectures. So in the next lecture, we are going to exactly do that. So see you in the next lecture. Bye. Hey guys, welcome back. So I hope you are liking it so far. Um, we're just adding more things incrementally. I didn't want to really start typing some code right from lecture one. Um, the, the concept is to see if we can slowly keep adding more and more stuff into it and slowly we can uh, introduce the concept of machine learning. All right, so now we know about algorithms that it's types and, you know, it's categorization and, you know, things like that. But uh, one of the things which kind of I keep repeating is this diagram, right? You have the input data and then you supply it to a machine learning algorithm and that will actually give you patterns predictions. Now I will keep repeating this as we'll use the same approach and keep adding more and more stuff to this. All right, so for us to, um, you know, start with our first uh, machine learning implementation, right? We need some data set, right? And generally data set will be, um, you know, depending upon your business problem and your uh, domain knowledge, you will gather the data set. But let's keep things very simple for now. Let's kind of take a data set, which is, um, you know, readily available, publicly available, and we'll apply some algorithms to it, right? So in that way, you at least know how things work. And then we can, you know, start taking some examples where we kind of take some inputs, modify it, and so on and so forth, right? So one of the data sets that's like commonly available and, and any machine learning book that you take, you will, you might find a reference to this. It's called as the IRIS data set, right? Now, basically, this is nothing but 50 rows of data. Right and iris. Um, basically, there are three species of iris um, that that's basically um, mentioned in this particular data set. Right. So what they have done is they have taken um, some measurements, basically the length and width of the sepals and petals, um, and then depending upon those measurements, they basically say what type of iris it is. Right. What what is the species? Is is it a iris? Uh, Cetosa, uh, Virginica, or Versicolor, right? So if I, actually there's a Wikipedia link, let me open that for you. And it kind of explains, um, you know, some history behind it, but the data looks something like this, right? So basically, as I said, it has about 50 rows in it. And, oh, it has more than 50 rows in it. But anyways, um, so the, these are the, you know, different species. And what we see in this particular data is, you know, the sepal length and sepal width and petal, petal length and petal width, right? And depending upon those measurements, 
you know the species is identified so the concept is as we have kind of discussed before is if we supply this data to a machine learning algorithm and in future if we get a particular um you know iris sample can we kind of um, looking at the pattern of um, you know its length width and you know petal length width can we kind of uh, identify what type of um, you know uh, iris species is it so that's that's the whole idea behind it right so definitely read through this um, you know some rich data set over here and um, you know uh, they'll give you some information on the history as well all right so i guess it should have i believe 150 so basically i think it's 50 samples of each of those species right so yes so it's not total 50 it's 50 per sample okay all right so now let's see how can we download this data right so let me go ahead and um just google this iris um, data set download and let's see if there is something publicly available all right let's take this right so this has this publicly available data and and uh, one thing is uh, if you kind of use this website there is tons and tons of data set that you can kind of um, you know use it in practicing your uh, machine learning algorithms as well all right so let's go ahead and see if we can kind of uh, download this data so data folder yeah we have iris data and this looks like uh, let me actually just copy the url and let me launch a notebook all right so we are going to probably open the same um, you know uh, notebook that we created yesterday that we practiced all right so what i'm going to do over here is I'm to add a couple of cells and first thing is that we can look at the data and the way we can look at this is if, if you remember i mentioned that um, you know just read a little bit about modules functions and you know stuff like that so i'm going to uh, basically write some code over here to visualize the data right so data is coming from that particular download url link that i have copied to my clipboard just said copy copy link address and the way we are going to do that is we're going to say from ipython dot display i want to import html and i'll say html followed by you know the url that i just copied and what i'm going to do is i'm going to press control and enter and it's kind of going to you know download the data from that url and you know it's going to display it in line now this is this is where i said that it's really really powerful right um, with minimal minimal amount of code you can actually <laughs> directly download something from from you know a url and start to work with that data and again if you want to like format it a little bit that's also totally fine and, and it goes the same way um you know you you don't need to write this again but just just for simplicity um display import html and i'm going to say uh, html and then you can just you know format it as a normal html so i can just say something like iframe um, the source should be uh, my url right and um that's it put it in an iframe hopefully this should work all right so you know it kind of formatted that all right so we now have kind of played around with it um you know how to look at the data but but let's let's take a little bit of a deep dive into the data as such right um you know the the, re the reason being that um you know uh, we we really need to uh, understand certain terminologies that we will be using throughout so this is how our data is looking like right and in future what we'll do is we will call the number of rows here as observations right as the english word observations you have you know each row is an observation so these rows are called observations the columns the input that we have been referring to so far we'll be calling it as features right and the target 
is these values you know the the iris pc values so three terms which we'll be using your observations number of rows uh, your inputs that is called features and your predictions or outputs that is that we'll call as targets right these are the common input terminologies we will be using throughout all right so if you kind of relate it to our input sample our iris data sample your input data that is sepal length sepal width uh, petal length and petal width um, which you will be supplying to an algorithm these are called feature names right and the output data these are called as target names okay so just just keep in mind uh, about those two things all right so moving on so now uh, you need to remember two main things which will be used throughout this course right um you know uh, one number one is you need to pass your inputs and outputs as different objects and python calls this as numpy array so don't worry too much about it um you know we we will look at an example just just after this numpy is but nothing but an inbuilt packaging system just imagine it as an array but it's optimized for faster processing right and the second thing is all your inputs and outputs that you give it to an algorithm should be numerical right but that's that's tricky because these things are numerical but what about the outputs or targets they are not numerical right so what we can do is we can simply assign some numbers to it right we can call cetoza as zeros um versi colors as maybe one and so on and the good thing is that python will actually do this for you and we'll we'll look at it you know um, just just in a short while we'll look at um, you know all those things all right so having said all of those things i would just like you to take a small pause and uh, go through these reading materials right uh, because these are the concepts that we will be using we'll be using numpy um, and we'll be using the two things that we discussed right um your uh, inputs and outputs in a you know numpy array and then uh, making sure that the inputs and outputs are converted to numerical form and then supplying it to an algorithm that's precisely what we'll see so if you see the diagram i have changed it a little bit now i want you to just just take a guess on why we used an upper case x and a lower case y and submit your answers in the forum in the next lecture we'll precisely use that and directly start coding thank you hey folks welcome back in the previous few lectures we saw how to read data in python we also saw the concept of fitting a model or passing input to an algorithm mainly comprises of two steps right first you need to pass your input and output um as different objects and we will be using the numpy arrays and i've given some uh reading materials also that will help you understand this concept and secondly you need to make sure that your inputs and outputs are numerical in this particular lecture we will be looking at some code all right so let me go ahead and just open up the uh, jupyter notebook that we were working with and what i'm going to do is we're going to work with the iris data set the same data set that we kind of talked about in the previous few lectures all right i pressed the button b uh to go to a new cell and again if you press the button h it will show you all the um shortcuts that you can use and i just inserted a new cell below by pressing the button b all right i'll close this and then i'm going to type in some code now um iris data set right we we looked at um you know the data from this particular website now iris data set is like the hello world of uh, machine learning right and and hence um, um you know uh, scikit actually gives you uh, this particular data set in built and so we can just directly use them we don't need to go ahead and you know download it from any url and stuff like that but i just wanted to show you that you know in case you have a csv file how do you go about loading that data and working with it so for this particular tutorial we'll keep it very simple so the way you can do that is first of all you need to go ahead and um, you know use the concept of modules and functions that we talked about so in the sk learn dot datasets there is actually an inbuilt um iris dataset so i'm going to use the 
load iris method and next what i'm going to do is i'm going to use the load iris to get all the data and store it in the iris object okay so this is right now stored there and next what i'm going to do is um, of course uh, let me show you a few things right so if you look at the type of this object that i just created if i press control and enter it's actually um, something called as bunch now what exactly is bunch right you must have been probably heard this for the first time because um, you know normal data types that you hear uh, are objects or integers or strings and stuff like that here you see something called as bunch so what are they so if we go back to our particular notes um, bunch is nothing but it's it's kind of a special data type that uh, scikit provides in order to store your data set so in the bunch data type there are many many attributes so if we kind of visualize visualize that with the data that we have uh, the data attribute will basically have the entire data right target will have all the target names or your outputs so data is all your input values target is all your output values um, as we discussed these column headers are called as features right so if you just use the feature names it will actually output what are the column names of your input data and similarly if you basically look at the target name uh, it will actually uh, specify the targets names as well we can quickly look at that in the code as well, but I just wanted to kind of uh, show you how this all relates. So uh, let's 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 look at the data target feature names and target names as well. So how do we do that? So let me go ahead and insert a new cell by pressing the button B. And now what I'm going to do is I am going to um, let me just print out a few things. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to print um, Iris dot feature names right so what 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 should it give me it should basically these are all the features these are all the feature names right sepal and sepal width and so on and so forth so if i press control and enter it will basically give me that information right so this is this is basically our feature names all right so let me press control let me press the button b and then um, you know print out a few oops sorry print out a few more things um, then we talked about target name. So what, how does that look like? And again, it's, these are all inbuilt keywords. So target names, if I press control enter, it's going to show me the value. So these are all the target names, the, the prediction values, right? Or output values. All right. So let's, let's try uh, something else. Let's, let's try. I always do this mistake. Print. Um, I'll do iris dot target and it kind of gives me a vector over here right of zeros and ones and if you remember um, the two main rules oops that loads okay something happened so the two main rules that we discussed is basically uh, your inputs and outputs should be numerical your outputs are not numerical here and what it has done is it has assigned certain integer values for for the output values right for example setosa is assigned number zero um, you know, versi color may be assigned number one and so on and so forth, right? So if we kind of look at this particular thing, you see that it is zeros and ones. So it's it's kind of ready to, you know, uh, supply it to our algorithm as well, right? Um, and then what did we forget? Let's, let's go ahead and um, uh, look at um, our data as well. So print iris dot data, control enter, and it'll kind of show you that particular matrix. Right. So two important things you should note over here. I called this as a vector. I call this as a matrix. Right. Um, now, naturally, you see that both of them are numerical. Um, and how do we really identify whether um, both of them are numpy arrays? Right. We, we our first rule was that your input and output should be, first of all, different objects that we can definitely put it, you know, place it as different objects, but they should be numpy arrays. And then the second thing is input and output should be numerical when you supply it to an algorithm. Now, um, definitely they are numerical, but I need to make sure they are, um, you know, of numpy arrays as well. So I'm going to press the button B, enter. And then the way that you can just test that is you can just say 
show me the type of iris dot data and it's a numpy right um, similarly let me go ahead and do for the other thing right um, it's iris dot target and that is a numpy array so it looks like you know the the initial portion the input is is getting ready right um now um you, you know both both the conditions are satisfied um the initial conditions are getting ready and then uh, before we supply it to the algorithm i also told that both of them input and output should be different objects of numpy arrays they are numpy arrays for sure we just found out let's just put them as different objects right so i'm going to store the data portion that is this portion in capital letter x right because it's a matrix and i'm going to store all these values the zeros and ones which we um, you know just looked at uh, those are vectors um, i'm going to store it in in lower case y right so let me go ahead to in my uh, python program and then let me actually the new cell and um, what i'm going to do is i'm going to store iris dot data in capital x and i'm going to store oops iris dot target in capital y and press control enter and it has stored them right so all of our conditions are satisfied so the first part of it is satisfied right we have capital x capital y both are numerical different objects they are in numpy arrays now the first portion is done next is basically we need to supply this to an algorithm and that is what we call it as fitting this data into an algorithm and in this case we are going to be using the knn algorithm now um before we proceed further let me spend about a few minutes actually talking to you what is the knn algorithm now the goal of this is definitely not going in too much detail of you know how the how this relates to in statistics what are the different equations and stuff like that but at a high level i just wanted to tell you what this knn algorithm does now uh, please note that we are going pretty slow over here right we we are typing a few lines of code and then talking about some theoretical aspects and stuff but we'll i, I promise we'll start uh, picking up some pace um because any algorithm that you choose here or any input that you choose here has to follow these same steps right it has to be two different objects it has to be numerical it has to be numpy arrays and then there is couple of things you need to know in an algorithm once you get that framework very solid in your mind it doesn't really matter what your inputs are what your algorithms are the basic framework remains the same it's just fine tuning these two components right so that is why i'm going a bit slow all right so the next thing is uh, before we pass on let's look at what is knn algorithm now if we go to a wikipedia link and i strongly suggest that you read about this um, you know in, in in depth but um, let me give you a high level overview so um let's look at some example if there is an example here all right let, let, let's look at these numbers right these these figures so if you look at this this basically has some points in it right to it is very simple simple concept it has some points in it and and what are these points is just imagine this is your y axis this is your x axis right and um it it basically has an x coordinate and y coordinate um and according to what values are what values it is it has been plotted in this graph let's let's assume that this red point has an x coordinate of uh, 2 and the y coordinate of 3 so this is and then the output is say red right so basically they have gone ahead and plotted these points and they have colored those points so this will be uh, something like maybe 5 comma 2 and blue right so they have kind of plotted all these points over here now if you closely look at this very closely look at this you can actually draw some sort of a boundary here right imaginary just imagine that there is a boundary over here and you color that boundary as red all those are this is red portion it's it's like marking your territory right you can actually mark a small territory here for green you can mark a territory here something like this for blue right now in essence of what i'm trying to say over here is let's assume that you get a point in future which says it's um, say 6 comma 5 it will be somewhere over here right 6 comma 5 will lie somewhere over here now looking at this territory can you guess what is the what, what what would be the color of that point whether it will be blue red green or you know whatever it is since we have said that this this anything that lies in this particular region is blue 
the chances are that it is very likely that that point is blue. Hence, we predict that that particular point that you gave me as an input, the prediction is blue, right? So that is the whole goal of this. So we pick up different values for K and we start fine tuning these boundaries, right? So if I go to my next image, this is how it looks like. This is what I talked about, right? So you have actually drawn a little boundary over here and marked the whole background as red. Similarly for blue. So next if a point comes over here, you know that it's basically, you know, um, lying in the green region, hence the point will be green, right? So this is basically called as the K nearest neighbors algorithm. Now I have, I have very much oversimplified this, but uh, definitely, um, you know, you, you will need to read about this, understand a little bit about the Euclidean space, um, you know, the distance between two points, the distance between neighbors and stuff. Uh, but once you understand this whole story, which I told you, uh, you will be able to appreciate that whole concept of, um, you know, distances and how this whole algorithm works and so on and so forth. So, um, hope you get, um, get, get some insights on that. Uh, please read the whole thing. And the next, in the next lecture, what we are going to do is we're going to take this a little bit further now, since we know that, um, you know, what KNN algorithm is, we are going to take the X and Y that we just created and then pass it on to a KNN algorithm and study the patterns, right? How the patterns are occurring right? Or how the how the whole model fits in. All right, so hope you enjoyed this particular lecture. See you in the next one. Bye. Hey guys, welcome back. So let's go ahead and continue our journey uh, in which we start building our machine learning uh, model and try fitting our model. So what we did in the last lecture is we we in detail saw how to define your capital X and small y, the matrix and the vector right so this is nothing but your input phase right so you basically gave your inputs and your outputs to the algorithm now in this lecture we are going to precisely look at that particular portion that the second phase of it like how do you supply it to an algorithm which we basically called as fitting the model right so essentially there is again a simple framework that you need to follow uh, there are three steps to it right when you actually start writing some code one is you have to import the class second one is you have to instantiate it and third is what we call as fitting the model so don't worry too much in in, in about two minutes i'll show you how to do that and these are the three steps which we will pretty much require in any algorithm that you're trying to use so in this we'll we'll be starting with the knn or the k nearest neighbor algorithm in the previous lecture we talked a little bit about what that whole algorithm is about right how do you draw draw the boundaries and the neighbors and stuff like that now again just to reiterate that was a very very oversimplified way of telling you what knn does um definitely uh you know it will require a more statistical lecture to go in very much detail about what that algorithm does and so on and so forth and what what i um probably was thinking is that's not a perfect fit for this particular course because here we are just trying to get ourselves acquainted with the concept of data science you know what are the components involved and so on and so forth all right so the way that i generally start off is um, you know before i implement any algorithm i would just go to the scikit-learn website and look at some uh, documentation and sample code so this is how it looks like Right, you just type in the KNN uh, search and it'll give you a bunch of stuff here, right? So the class is sklearn.neighbors, um, you know, and you use the K neighbors classifier and you pass in a bu bunch of things in it and, and we'll see more into that. All right, so, um, you know, there is, there is good explanation on what each of those parameters do. And if we don't supply those parameters, it's going to actually use the default values, right? And here is some sample code to get started with. Now, this is what I generally use, um, you know, to just look at how they are importing the classes, modules, and so on and so forth, and how they are fitting in the models. But don't don't worry about it. Let me, I'll show you from scratch all these things. But I just wanted to let you know that this is how you should be starting when you choose another algorithm. All right, so let's go ahead and start writing some code. So this is the portion we are going to do now. 
right so i have opened my jupyter workbook and in the last lecture we defined capital x and small y right and this we are going to go ahead and fit the model all right so if you remember initially what we said was that first is we have to import the class right and looking at the documentation we found that to import the class we need to use the k neighbors classifier right so i'm going to use sk learn dot neighbors and i'm going to import the k neighbors classifier and how did i get this i just looked at this particular documentation k neighbors classifier so I need to do this. So I need to import that first. And let me go ahead and press um, control and enter. And it has imported that. And next what I'm going to do is I am going to use the KNN. Um, actually, I need to first instantiate K neighbors classifier, right? So I'm going to use K neighbors classifier and I'm going to just pass in one default value over here. The number of neighbors equal to one. And I'm going to store this in KNN object. All right, so um, just keeping it very simple here, I passed in N underscore neighbors is equal to one. And if you look at the documentation, there are actually lots and lots of parameters that you need you can pass right and all the parameters are listed here and what we did was that we just passed one of them right n underscore neighbors and if you don't pass all of them all it'll do is it'll use the default values now to keep this example very very simple let it take the default values right we'll just use k the the number of neighbors equal to one and fit the model and see how it predicts right the goal is again not to go into too much detail of the algorithm here but just to look at some working code so i'll press control and enter and it gives me an error because i might have misspelled something okay so that worked out fine and now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to print this k in an object control enter and it's if you see that it has actually set all the default values except for n underscore neighbors equal to one because that is what we passed it so these are all the values that you can set when you are instantiating the class right and any algorithm that you take this it'll be the same principle to be followed there'll be a couple of default values that you can set and then um, you know you can use it going forward all right i'm going to press the button b for a new cell so now we have the instantiated class right now we have we can go ahead and fit the model the way we can do that is we use the knn um, object that we just created and then just call the fit method and pass in two things our input matrix capital x and our output vector small letter y or lowercase y once we do that it will actually complete that next fitting the model step Right? So this is the step I'm talking about. So it will actually take an X and Y and put it into the algorithm. That is basically called as fitting the model. All right. So that is done. Now, how do I know that, you know, this all worked fine? And, and you know, how do I know whether it's predicting something? And uh, the answer is very simple. Let's let's try inputting some values and, and see whether it can predict something, right? So let's go ahead and do something. So if I use the KNN dot, and there is something called as a predict method. These are all inbuilt methods. Um, let me pass on some values to it. So I have some values here, two, four, three, one, right? And this is again similar to our um, earlier uh, table, right? So we used to pass in values like this 5.1, comma, 3.5, comma, 1.4, comma, 0.2. These are the four, um, um, you know, input values or features. 
So I'm going to just use that. So I'm going to pass another four random values, two, four, three, one, and see what it predicts. So the way you can do is just pass in as one matrix, two, um, four, sorry, two, four, three, one. I can I can kind of do this, and whatever is the results, I can kind of store it in, say something. You, you can name it anything. I'm just calling it prediction. And you know the value is now stored in the prediction um, uh, variable that I just created. Now I am going to just uh, go ahead and, and 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 you can actually even look at the type of prediction. So it's an ND array. So it returned an array. So when I call the predict method, it returned an array over here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just print it out. Okay. So it it basically retain retain an uh, return an array and the value is zero. Now what is zero, right? If you if you remember our our fundamental principle of um, you know of this algorithm, we said that it should be numerical and as separate objects and numpy arrays, right? So your output is also numerical. Now what is that zero? That is what we said that when when this particular table was created we said that i dot setosa may be zero i dot um, you know something else may be one um, and so on and so forth right so those are basically the target names now which target name corresponds to zero is what we have to find out now and to find that out is pretty simple right what i'm going to do is i'm going to just um, print out the target names and if you remember um, we we had used um, target underscore names to get that out and you see zero is setosa one would be versicolor and two would be virginica right this is how the um, you know the array would be numbered so in short we fitted the model and we tried for inputs two four three one right and the output was setosa so let's make a note of it so the output was zero or setosa so now what did we do is we we use the knn algorithm we used n is equal to 1 in our default values we passed in we fit the model first of all so that it learned the existing uh, inputs and outputs that we gave and then based on what we what it learned we said that okay now depending upon what you learned can you predict what happens when the inputs are 2 4 3 1 and it predicted that it is setosa right so congratulations you have written your first um, very raw very primitive um, program right so let's let's take this uh, a step further right so let's say that i want to predict so n n now we uh, predicted only one input right one row of data what if we need to do two and it's it's pretty simple so the way that you can do it is again the same thing i'm going to say store my results in prediction array and i'm going to use the same k dot predict and my first would be two four three one and i can just you know keep giving more and more inputs four six five three right so one line of data with two four three one second line with four six five three these are the features and let's see if it, it, it can predict something um, and let's see so it's 0 and 2 so that means it's setosa and persicola so when you give this input the output predicted output is 0 or setosa and for this one, 4653, it is versicolor or sorry, it is virginica or 2. Right? So let's make a note of it. So when I have 2, this remain the same. And this became virginica. Right? So I, I hope you're getting it. So I can kind of pass a complete matrix itself, like you know 
and then it can actually return a complete vector of all the predictions in one shot right so you know as as in when you need to have more and more inputted data um to be predicted you can use different forms and techniques but right now i'm just using one or two examples and in like later videos we'll see how to kind of pass in 50 lines of inputs 100 lines of inputs as a complete uh, matrix and then you know get the output all right so um before we go any more further i would like to also tell you that we used knn equal to one right so what will happen if I have to use KNN equal to 5, right? So KNN equal to 5, what will happen? We know the values of 1. So let us just copy that. And let's see if the value of if N has changed, does the predictions change, right? Let's see. So for KNN equal to phi, I'm just going to use another object. I'll call this as KNN phi. And then I'm going to use the same thing, K neighbors classifier. And now in default value, I'm going to just pass in N underscore neighbors equal to phi. If you see above, what we did is that we use the same thing from SK learn neighbors. Oh, by the way, you have already imported the K neighbors classifier, so you don't have to import it again. But we used KNN object um, and then um, we just use N underscore neighbors for K neighbors classifier. Now we are just using another one KNN5. You can call this anything you want. But now I'm, I'm basically instantiating with uh, N equal to 5, the number of neighbors equal to 5. Right. So once that is done, I am going to use the same thing, right? I'm going to use KNN5 dot fit. And I'm going to pass in my entire capital X, entire matrix, and my output, and let it study the interactions between both of them. So it did that. And next, what I'm going to do is I am going to just create a new object. Let's call this prediction phi. And I'm going to use knn5 dot predict. And I'll use the same inputs that I passed in for my previous example. Right, my, but my previous example was based for n equal to 1. Now here it is n equal to 5. Let's see if that makes a difference. And let me go ahead and print prediction 5. So now it is 0 and 1. Earlier it was 0 and 2. Right? So now it is saying it is Cetosa and Versicolor. So let's make a note. Alright. So, like, why is this happening? Right? Um, you know, for n is equal to 1, we got some other results. For n is equal to 5, we got some other results. In the coming lectures, we will definitely see what is what is more correct. Right now, we don't know what is more correct. Right, And, and let's keep it that way for now. Right, Let's just, our, our intention is to, you know, get some practice over fitting particular algorithms, uh, models, and stuff like that. And in the coming lectures, our goal would be to tune that, right, given n is equal to 1, n is equal to 5, n is equal to 8, 13 or whatever numbers or even another um, algorithms, right? Here we are just using KNN, right? So we we use say 10 algorithms with different input variables, you will get different results. So that is where the fine tuning will come and, and you know, kind of shortlisting out of those 30 things that we saw, which is more closest to the correct answer, right? So we have reached here, we have, we have seen k n is equal to 1. Two, two inputs and two predictions, n is equal to two, uh, sorry, n is equal to five and, and another two predictions for the same set of inputs. Now, what I want you guys to do is, can you repeat this for n is equal to eight and see what results you are getting, right? So in further readings, I have given you uh, something on K neighbors classifier, uh, the documentation that I used, but more importantly, can you run this for 
n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 up till 30 and build a table. And it's actually very simple. If you see this whole thing took me three lines of code. So what I want you guys to do is learn something or read uh, about Python looping construct. How can you run this in a loop? Right. And I have provided a small link which will help you get there. But um, basically, um, you know, um, try try doing that. And I have given you answers for n is equal to 8 over here. Um, and it's it's again the same thing, right? I just use this same example. But um, the default value while instantiating, I just gave it as n is equal to 8. Like n underscore neighbors equal to 8 and ran the whole stuff again. And this is the answer that I got. But um, try it out from 1 to 30 in a loop, in an automated loop and see if you can, you are able to, um, you know, get that. And if you are able to get that, please post it in the forum. It will be really a nice achievement, I would say, if you are an absolute starter. Um, and the next thing is um, definitely uh, take one more algorithm. Take logistic regression. We used k nearest neighbor. Use logistic regression and try to run the same algorithm, sorry, a same set of inputs, but for different algorithm called logistic regression. Right, and, and, and try to take a stab at that. I'll show you how to do that as well. But if you just type in logistic regression, you will get some documentation around it. And, um, you know, I showed you how I do it. This is how you can import the class, right? And this is how you pass in the default values, um, you know, and, and try to read a little bit about that and um, see how much it varies from KNN in terms of uh, what predictions it is making. So uh, we are getting more and more into it. Hope you're liking it. Um, in the next lecture, we'll look at uh, a few more things, um, a new algorithm, um, and then and see what type of predictions it gives us. Thank you and see you in the next lecture. All right, welcome back. So we are in chapter number nine right now. And, um, you know, if we were to give a quick rewind of what we did so far, we basically learned how to calculate the capital X or, or the matrix X and um, the vector Y. That is basically uh, your first part of uh, preparing your inputs. And then we passed it to an algorithm and we used the K nearest neighbor algorithm and we used different values of K, right? Different parameters for K in the K nearest neighbor or KNN algorithm itself. Now what we are going to do over here is we are going to repeat the same thing in, in, in this lecture, but we are going to use a different algorithm. Um, in this we are going to use logistic regression. And the idea behind uh, doing that is to give you an idea of um, you know, how, how do we kind of um, test with different algorithms or different parameters of the same algorithm. In the previous lecture, we exactly saw that, right? We, we just used one algorithm, KNN or the K nearest neighbor, but we use different parameters. K is equal to 1, K is equal to 5, K is equal to 8 and so on and so forth. So you find that there are variances in that. In this, we are going to use a different algorithm altogether. So you get a, um, you know, practice of both of them. So if we go back to our lecture number one or two, where we discussed this, this is still a classification problem logistic regression, um, you know, is an algorithm for classification problem. Now, um, again, um, you know, in the further reading section, I have given you a very good uh, YouTube link of one of the professors who uh, explain a logistic regression. So I would encourage you to kind of watch that if you're interested in knowing in depth about that algorithm. But in general, classification algorithms are nothing but in which the outputs are uh, finite, right? So your input could be an email and your outputs could be whether it is spam or not spam, right? Something like that. So a finite set of outputs. So this is one such algorithm which is used to solve a classification problem. So this is the portion of it. So we use the K nearest neighbor. Now we are going to try one more algorithm. All right, so again, let's just revisit our uh, thing that we have been saying in every lecture. Um, the logic remains the same irrespective of what algorithm you use, right? You you calculate the capital X and small y. Um, you make sure that the two fundamental criteria are fulfilled, like, um, you know, both of them are different objects. They are numpy arrays and, and both of them are numerical, right? So we saw how to do that. And the next is basically we, we use an algorithm where we import the relevant class, instantiate it and fit the model. 
and let it study the inputs and outputs and then um, you know it, it you can it can predict based on those relationships so before we go into logistic regression let me just quickly open up the scikit learn um, documentation so this is how i generally start right so if i were to kind of have a set of inputs and if i want to try it uh, into a couple of algorithms i generally start with this so this is a nice place for you to kind of know a little bit of code and what are the default parameters and so on and so forth so this is the class and these are all the parameters um, again you you can you can read in detail about the parameters what what it does and what are the default values if you don't supply a parameter um, in your whole code right so this is this is how it works so let us go ahead to our notebook and then um, you know kind of run logistic regression so i have made a note of what all algorithms we have run so far so as i said we ran it for 1 5 and 8 and we got these values for these inputs um, let's let's um, you know fit a model uh, train and fit a model for logistic regression and pass in these two same inputs and see um, you know what is the prediction we get all right so I'll press the letter B, enter, and now what was the class? It was sklearn dot linear underscore model, right? And your class was uh, logistic regression. Okay. Let's go back to our notebook and then let's do this. sklearn dot linear and it was model. And I'm going to import logistic regression right and I'm going to just um, the next step is definitely instantiate the class so logistic regression and I'll just store it in an object called logistic reg something like this you can call it anything you want and the next step is fit the model so you basically use logistic reg um, dot fit and we have our x and y that we created now um, if you are actually um, you know if you have closed your notebook and you're opening it again uh, you might get an error right now because you know the code that you have um, on the top to, to basically store your capital x and y you might have to just recompile them so if, if if you get an error just make sure you go to each cell and then you know press Control enter to just execute them um, so that it knows what is X and what is Y. In our case, it should know because I've been using the same uh, notebook and I haven't closed the notebook. So it has fit the model, right? It has fit the logistic model. And now what we are going to do is we are going to use the predict method and pass in the two um, input parameters. So logistic, let's do this, logistic rig dot predict and we had our two inputs right so we'll use the these two same inputs and it should return an array so we'll just call it as prediction underscore logistic regression lr and um, once once it does that let's just go ahead and print the prediction underscore lr so it is to uh, the first the the prediction for the first input is two second input is two now if you remember um, you know two i believe was versicolor but let's we can just quickly check that as well and the way we do it is again same the iris data set and there's an attribute called target underscore names it's virginica i'm sorry so two is virginica so let's make a note of that so this came out to be 2 and the second one also came out to be 2 right now um, if you think about it for different algorithms or for different parameters inside the same algorithm the results can vary so how do we really choose which parameter or which algorithm 
is the right algorithm to choose for, right? And the answer is we don't know. We don't know because we have no idea about what the actual answer of 2, 4, 3, 1 or, you know, 4, 6, 5, 3 is. We, we don't know it. We just randomly took some numbers over here, right? But what if we actually had some input with, in which we actually know, know the actual output also so that we can kind of compare it with what these predictions are made. It's like quizzing the algorithm, right? And if we think about it a little bit more and deeper, we actually have that data, right? We, we have this rich set of input data that we use to train the algorithm, right? So once it is trained, why don't we just quiz the algorithm? Let's just pass the same values, 5.1, 3.5, 1.4, 0.2, .5, and see whether it predicts CETOSA. And if it does, we know that that's the correct answer, right? If it doesn't, we know that that's not, that's not the correct answer. So their algorithm is not providing a good answer, right? So that's that's kind of a good way. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to open up my, um, so by the way, let's just, I've just created a small table with, you know, I'm, I've chosen this first row and the last row, 6.3 in Versicara, right? And we, we will see what, what predictions these give for n is equal to one, n is equal to five, n is equal to 8 and logistic regression. We don't need to do everything. We'll just take one or two samples, but you, 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 you'll get the, you know, you get the idea about that. So I have the code over here. It's, it's, it's the same thing, which, you know, we, we kind of used in our previous lectures. So just for the interest of time, I just, um, you know, copied it. So we're just calling the predict method. It is same as what we did here, but instead of some random inputs, we are giving inputs for you know, um, whose outputs we actually know, right? The, in the first case, it is CETOSA, and the second case, it is um, Versicolor. We know the actual answers for this. So let's go ahead and run this. We say that, um, you know, it has actually correctly predicted 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 in, in all the three algorithms, right? So this is this is one of the ways of doing it, right? Um, now this was a very simple example. We did we just had like 150 rows of data over here, and we passed in some values to it. Now um, there has to be a more systematic way, right? What if you have a set of data, you calculated your capital X and small y, and now you want to try it for 10 algorithms? Would you keep doing this? Would you keep manually doing what I did right now? Or let's assume that each algorithm has um, you know, four different parameter combinations that you can use. Just like in KNN, we used K is equal to one, five, eight, and you know, I could even give 30 and stuff like that. So imagine that. So you have to actually try, try this for the same set of inputs like 50 times. And that's going to be time consuming, right? Because you're not going in, in when you, when you are in, when you're at a job, um, and, and you're solving a problem, you're not going to have inputs, which is just very simple 150 lines of input. You'll have inputs, which is like millions of rows. So when you actually give it for, uh, you know, training and stuff like that, each, each time you, you run something like this, right? Um, like dot fit and all here, it took like a second, depending upon your inputs, it could take an hour or two hours, right? Now imagine if you have to do that 50 times, it's going to be really, really time consuming. And how do you choose? So fortunately, there are some techniques to kind of choose, um, you know, optimal parameter or optimal algorithm that works with your set of inputs. Now, Python um, and uh, scikit-learn actually provides a lot of inbuilt mechanisms to do that in which it can tell you that, hey, if you use KNN with uh, K is equal to, with N is equal to five, your accuracy is 95%. But if it's N is equal to eight, the accuracy is 97%. But if you use logistic regression, the accuracy is 99%. And it can kind of give you a nice little table with all that details. And then you can just look at it and say, oh, wow, I think I should go with this algorithm and retrain my model because this is this is giving me, um, you know, the closest accuracy that I need. So in the coming lectures, we will be precisely doing all those things, right? We will be looking through uh, some of the mechanisms in which we can choose these um, different parameters or algorithms. 
now um, the whole idea of all these nine lectures was to get you get to a point where you're comfortable creating your inputs capital x small y and then um, choosing in, you know, not, not even choosing just just supplying to an algorithm and making some predictions right so remember that diagram which i always show in each lecture that is going to be the same now we are going into the portion where we start fine tuning the parameters of an algorithm or fine tuning the choice of algorithm right again we'll just touch all the simple basics of it and then go on um, you know we'll add more and more complex concepts as we go further in the lectures so so far i hope you're liking all the lectures if you do like please leave me a comment or um, you know in the in the forum on what do you feel what are the things that you're learning so far um, you know what are the things you'd like to see um, or or is it is it going too fast or is it at a comfortable pace um, and i'd really love to hear more on that the whole goal of this exercise was that you know um, i've taken a very complex subject and i've tried to um, assume that people are starting from absolute scratch and, and i've tried to remove all the complexity and make it as simple as possible um, and add a little bit of complexity in each lecture right so that it's not too overwhelming so i would love to hear, hear your feedback on on how things are going for you so far uh, before i conclude two things definitely watch the video that i provided um, it's a it's a nice um, uh, lecture and then definitely read about um, logistic regression if you are interested in knowing more on the algorithm if i were to cover that it will take me at least 45 minutes to kind of you know uh, go through each aspect of that algorithm that's not the whole goal of this course so i haven't done that but if you are interested definitely go for it it's a it's a nice little algorithm logistic um, you know um, um, regression all right so hope you liked it see you in the next lecture bye hey folks welcome back so a quick rewind what we did in the last few lectures were we we saw how to create x how to create your small y and then pass it on to an algorithm and particularly in the last lecture what we saw is that um, you know how how can we determine which algorithm is performing better right or is giving us more accurate predictions and the way we did that was uh, pretty rudimentary i would say what we did was um, we we took the data that we already know we know the inputs and outputs and uh, we just use the same inputs and um, compared if they are producing the same predictions as our outputs right so that's kind of a manual way of checking how you would do that so we did that for k is equal to 158 and logistic regression now um, this is okay right but then the thing is that you're never going to have 150 rows and um, you know very small data where you can manually do this and manually check this right and um, that is why we we need to do the same thing but in a more systematic way right and the framework that we um, use to do that is called as splitting the data into train and test now what that literally means is basically what we did manually right now uh, if you look at this particular uh, table this is this is the table that we all originally had this is the capital x and this is the capital y uh, small y Right? this is what we have been using to kind of um, train our model and fit the model and so on and so forth but now what i'm doing is that i'm saying that okay we have this rich set of data which has all the inputs and the and the correct outputs as well um you know let's let's use the same thing to test which uh, algorithm is performing more accurately so what we're going to do is we're going to take this data and split it into two parts right so we have five rows and i say that okay um you know maybe do a 70 30 split right 70 percent goes to x train and um you know 30 percent goes to x test so what we are saying is that when you split the data use these three x train data capital x uh, train and the outputs to train the model don't use all the rows but just use a portion of the rows maybe 70 percent of the whole data to train the model okay once you have done that from the remaining 30 percent where the model has not even seen the rows right so that would be a good test right so that's why we call it x test from the remaining 30 percent of the rows 
pass them as inputs and see what predictions we get and the reason why i say see what predictions we get is we already know the outputs right so if the prediction is cetosa then we know that the prediction was actually the right answer right so this is this is the way that we can we can do it so uh, just to repeat what we are doing is we are taking the entire data set and then making two slices of it the first slice is we are going to call it x train say 70% of the rows and we pass the inputs and outputs to the algorithm and fit the model the next slice we don't touch the outputs we just pass in the inputs and let the algorithm predict the outputs because we already know the correct output we can then compare and see whether it predicted correctly or not and we can use the same technique for different values of k different algorithms and so on and so forth and then we can kind of choose which is the most appropriate algorithm for our use case now there is a lot of words which i put in into this right um, splitting the data 70% 30% then there is x ray next test and all those things now the good news is that python already provides a framework for dealing with this situation right the the train and test situation so before we go there so this is how it will look diagrammatically right so we take x train and y train so that is this thing this whole thing and we pass it to the algorithm and let it study it and once it has created the model we take the x test this one these rows just the inputs not the outputs and let it predict right once it predicts we are going to compare those predictions against y test and see if the predictions were right or wrong so that's what we are going to do all right so now to do this fortunately um python provides some inbuilt frameworks and techniques so the first thing i wanted to show you was that it's called the train test split right and all it does is basically you can pass in your capital x and capital y and tell it split this for me in maybe 30 70 ratio randomly right randomly choose rows so that your test has um you know 30% of the rows and training set has 70% of the rows just by passing in some parameters you can do that you don't need to do anything manually so the way that it looks is basically something like this right um you import this module the train test module and just call this function right so um you say that you you pass in your capital x capital y and say split here they have said a test size should be 33% and so the remaining will be your training size and the random state is nothing but any number you can put uh, it's used as a seed for um you know randomization so if you have a set of 150 rows it will not take the first 80 rows as train and the remaining as test or something like that it will randomly choose 70% of the rows and for the algorithm for the randomization you can pass in some um you know number that can use as seed value now don't worry about the seed value and all just just remember that you can pass in some random integer over there and then um you know it will it will use that so a pretty useful function i would say so let's see um all right so let me actually open up my notebook all right so let me press b enter and then first thing what i'm going to do is i'm going to use the sklearn dot cross validation and it was i believe actually i should use model selection that's the new one so model selection and then this is um import train test split all right so that is done and then next what i need to do is i need to call the train test split and then pass in my capital x and small y and let's say my split size should be um 0.3 
and let's not use any random state for now let's just leave it under and what it will return is it will return those blocks right so you have x train and x test y test and y train so just look at the order in which i have passed it on so it's x train x test y train y test okay so we can just go back to our documentation and see if we have everything correct x train x test y train y test and they have just called this um, you know method which um, and then passed on x and y all right so half of our work so using two lines of code pretty much whatever i said like you know um, splitting the data and all is done using two lines of code you press control and enter and then it um, splits it all right so let's let's run some few tests right so if you see our original data we can look at the shape um, it had 150 rows and um, four columns in it right and then we basically said we are going to split that up so we let's see how how it split it so let's do print um x underscore train dot shape and then print x underscore test dot shape right so we have said that our test size should be 30 percent so yeah training is 105 uh, rows and then the test is 45 rows so you saw so you see that it has kind of split both of them into two different buckets right one is a 70% bucket used for training and other is 30% bucket which is used for testing it and again if you're curious I can also show you how it um, split the Y component it's pretty much the same right So, 105 and 45. All right. So we have that now. Let's let's um, you know continue with our journey. So what we are going to do is we are going to pass this X train and Y train into an algorithm. You can pass it to KNN algorithm or you can pass it to logistic uh, regression. Whatever it is, we we don't care at this point. Let us just take an example. All right. So I'm going to use maybe let let's do the logistic. Um, regression which we just created so you know we have imported all the classes and um, you know things like that um, in, in our code before so I'm not going to redo that whole thing so I'm going to just use um, you know logistic regression and this time to fit the model I'm going to use the logistic like dot fit and instead of passing capital X and capital Y I just want to pass X train and Y train. Okay. Once that is done, some error. Let's see. Uh, maybe I misspelled something. Logistic, right? Logis. Okay. That worked. So it has fitted the model. Now I can go and predict it, right? So I'll say logistic um, reg dot predict. And we used to pass in some random inputs over here. But what we're saying is that now let's pass the X test, right? That is this portion of it, these values. So X test. And then whatever um, you know it returns, let's just store it into y product variable, right? All right, so that is done. So we have um, you know fitted that into um, you know we we have trained the model using x train and y train. That is seventy percent um, you know of the total number of rows that we have, and then from the remaining thirty percent, we have asked it to predict. Now it has predicted, and all the predictions are stored here. But the good news is that we also know the actual answers, the stored in Y test, right? So if, merely if we compare our Y test and Y prediction, we will know um, whether uh, how, how accurate our predictions are, right? And fortunately, there is also a simple way of doing that. 
it's called accuracy score and if you look at the documentation um, there is this accuracy score where you um, pass in the true values and the predicted values and it will kind of compare both of them and tell you um, how many of those values match or don't match right it will give you a percentage score so this is how it is done so it's under the sk learn metrics you import the accuracy score module and then you pass the true values and the predicted values in our case the true values is y underscore test right that's where the actual values are and the predicted values we just stored in y underscore predict and it will just tell you that okay it will spit out a score which will tell you that okay when I, when I compared both the values 50% of the times it matched 50% didn't match right so let's let's do that so y predict has all those things and then now I'm going to do from sklearn import metrics and I'm going to say print metrics dot accuracy score and I'm going to pass in my y test to be compared against y product look at the order also over here maybe I had some spelling error let's see ah. okay so it has a 97.777 percent accuracy meaning if you compare both of them 97 percent of the times it matched right so you can say that the logistic regression algorithm gives a accuracy of 97 percent so let's make a note of that something like this right now we can repeat that for different um, models as well right so let's let's do um, you know knn equal to 1 right you can you can use the same thing uh, same principles the same framework we're going to follow and just so that we don't waste too much of time i have some code in my clipboard so it's the same thing which we did right we, we did a knn dot fit x and y but we're going to do x train and um, you know uh, y train and then we are going to predict and then we are going to compare the test value with the predictions and see how accurate our predictions are so here it is 95 percent accurate so i am going to make a note of that got it what was it 95.55 okay all right so if i just um, let, let's do one more right so that we have some data to play with So let's do KNN5, the same thing that we did above. And if I do that, that gives 97.77. So now you're getting more closer to say that, okay, maybe KNN equal to one is not a, you know, a, a good choice, but logistic regression and N is equal to five is giving me some good predictions or some accurate predictions. Now, um, let us, let me, let me slightly change something and, and show you how a simple parameter change can cause the prediction accuracy to go high or low drastically, right? And, um, again, a prediction of hundred percent doesn't really mean it's an awesome algorithm. Um, so when you actually read the, you know, int the, the uh, internals of the algorithm, you will know more about it, but. We will look at a few techniques in the coming lectures as well. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that instead of 30% use 40% and use a random state um, equal to something, four, right? Let's see if this makes a difference. So let me go ahead and execute this. Then our shape is this. Now see it has split it into 40%. So our test size is 40% and 60% is your uh, training size. Similarly, your Y train and Y test shapes change. Now let us do a logistic regression and let us look at the accuracy. See the accuracy reduced now to 95% for logistic regression. Earlier it was 
right so let's make a note of it all right so so that we have we know what we're doing so now it is 95% so you see that the accuracy has reduced a little bit now let's do this this goes to 95 this goes to 96 so like what 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 did we you know what can we see over here the thing is that we saw three situations one is with different values of k the accuracy changes second is with different algorithms the accuracy changes and the third is with our training and test sizes and random number seed generations the accuracy changes so naturally, there must be some sweet spot between three these three main um, you know variables, where we can we can try out um, you know a lot of values, and there will be a sweet spot where we can say that for um, you know um, you know k is equal to this thing for this algorithm, uh, when the test size is say 0.4 and random state is this, this is the maximum accuracy you are ever going to get, right? So the most optimum values is test size may be 0.4, random state is 4 and KNN equal to 5. That is what fits for your particular input and this is the algorithm you need to use and that is the best accurate algorithm you're going to have in this suite of algorithms that you're trying to do. Right? Now that sounded like a lot but by now you must have realized there are frameworks for it. Right? So basically what I'm trying to say over here is Lot of factors are involved in choosing and fine tuning a particular algorithm. We just, I just showed you the different possibilities, right? Different possibilities of, you know, making some changes and more importantly, how you can split into train and test, right? And then um, get some um, good estimates for predictions. All right. So before we go further, um, you know, and then, you know, go a little bit more deep dive into you know, considering all these factors and finally choosing an algorithm and a value of K or a value of random state and so on and so forth, I want to do a few things, right? You know how to calculate the accuracy scores by now by splitting into X train, X test and Y train, Y test and then, you know, you have the sample codes which I showed you. Can you repeat that for N is equal to 1 to 30 and tell me what value of N gives you the gives you the highest accuracy you can assume any state for your um, you know your, your test split and your random state and all and keep it consistent for all the 30 values that that's fine the idea is can you do that and if you remember in one of the assignments in the previous lectures i had i had kind of asked you guys to take a stab at um, you know learning the looping constructs in python so that in one shot you can actually uh, fit in um, you know the KNN algorithm for values 1 to 30 in a loop right now do the same thing but find you know display in a table or even a graph um, you know the accuracy values second is basically the same thing right um, for k is equal to 1 to 30 plot it on the x-axis and whatever is your accuracy score between 0 and 1 plot it on the y-axis so there's a documentation I have given it is very simple three four lines of code and then you can get all these cleanly plotted out in a graph right we are going to discuss uh, a deeper variation of what i what i um, explained in this lecture right we're going to take it a step further and get a more refined framework to choose your algorithm and your parameters and it's called the k-fold cross validation um, just so that it's not too overwhelming i would strongly suggest that you first read this right get an understanding of this and because it will be incremental to this lecture, so it shouldn't be that difficult. Um, so, but having it, uh, having some pre-reading helps. And then try to take a guess on what are the, some of the disadvantage of this method that I asked you, right? So one of the things is definitely I showed you the random state variables. 
if you just change a little bit here and there the accuracy scores you know change so um if you can think of more disadvantages uh please um you know mention it in the forum or in the form of comments so that um you know we can share your knowledge on this so i hope you are getting more closer to uh, developing data science um, you know fitting models and and choosing algorithms and stuff and hope you are liking it and as usual um please feel free to visit my website www.rakeshgopal.com and then um you know definitely send me your questions and stuff via forums and uh, tell me what you like what you don't like and is the speed okay um so we'll we'll see you in the next lecture thanks for joining in hello and welcome back i hope you are enjoying all the videos so far uh, we looked at a lot of things um in in creating a data science model we looked at how to you know pass on your inputs and stuff like that so here we are going to take one step further all right so a quick rewind of what we did so far we we looked at how to calculate our capital x and small y right we we looked at the input matrix um we also saw how to split that capital x and small y into training and test sets right and then what we saw was that we we supplied the inputs to different algorithms we saw the knn algorithm we tried with n is equal to 1 n is equal to 5 n is equal to 8 then we tried another algorithm called logistic regression and what we did was that we we calculated our accuracy scores how accurate is our predictions and we saw that for each algorithm or for each parameter within an algorithm the accuracy score varies right and that 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 was one of the primary reasons where we where we thought that maybe if we split our inputs into a training and test set we may be able to improve that situation now comes the question of given that for any algorithm we choose right our accuracy scores may vary or given the way that we choose our training set and our test set or the sample sizes our accuracy scores vary is there a more systematic way to handle all of this like we have the input data with us we know what algorithms we are going to run all we need is some sort of help in which we can say that hey i have the set of 10 algorithms i have this set of uh, input data can you suggest me which algorithm will give me the most accurate results for my given set of data and that's precisely what we are going to look at in this particular lecture so imagine a situation like this and and i just like these kind of diagrams where it over simplifies stuff let's assume that you you supply your capital x and small y and along with a list of all algorithms that you want to be tested right so you supply knn with n is equal to 1 n is equal to 5 logistic regression maybe decision trees and so on and so forth you just give a list to something called called as k fold cross validation just just think of it as some sort of a framework right and what that framework does is it it basically gives you an output which says that hey i have studied all the inputs and the different algorithms and i have run some variations and for your given set of data um you scan in with n is equal to 5 right that is the maximum accuracy uh that you are given given the information that you have supplied to me right so that is that is what we are going to see in this particular lecture right so python gives us so many tools size um, size it learn gives us um so many tools to kind of deal with such situations right so we are going to do that in this lecture all right so this particular technique is called as k fold cross val validation now what exactly is this so i have a wikipedia link and let me quickly go there and if you remember what we did with our capital x and small y is we split them into training and test sets and um if you need to take a break here and rewind and then watch my previous lecture please uh do that because you know i'll not be explaining what is a training set what is a test set it's pretty simple so imagine that this is your input diagram right it this, this is your input data each ball over here represents one row of data right 
So here there are about 20 rows of data. In our iris data set, we had 150 rows of data. What cross validation, k fold cross validation does is it chooses the test data and training data, right? And tries different combinations of that. So in iteration number one, you see the first five rows is treated as test data and the remaining is treated as training data. In the next iteration, it will choose the next five rows as test data and everything else as training data. In the next one, it'll choose the next few rows as test data and everything else as training data. So you get the picture, right? So all it is doing is, instead of just randomly choosing five rows and you know test, uh, test data and training data, and then supplying it to an algorithm and saying, hey, the accuracy score is this much, what it is doing is it is it is basically playing around with different combinations of test and training data so that it's it's able to test it with the algorithm as to if the training set keeps changing how does that how does the validate how does the accuracy score change right and think of it this way right when when it chooses the first time when you choose the training data maybe it chose the best set of data and the algorithm really worked fine with that data and the accuracy score was 98, right? And would you go ahead and choose that algorithm? Well, maybe not, right? But this particular technique will at least choose different combinations and permutations of training data and test data. And depending upon those different iterations, it will basically give you a accuracy score. Like for iteration one, the accuracy score may be 98. For iteration two, the accuracy score may be say 94. For iteration three, the accuracy may be say 95. So if you have uh, k is equal to four, you'll have four iterations. And basically you can just then take a mean of all the accuracy scores and, and say that for this particular algorithm and for this particular set of inputs, the mean accuracy score is whatever, say 95, right? And you can repeat the same with another algorithm. You can repeat the same with another algorithm. So playing around with different combinations and permutations of input will actually give you a better accuracy um, um, score, um, you know, so that you can make proper judgments. All right, so I would strongly um, encourage you to read this whole thing. It's a wonderful article here, and I have actually given you a link in the further reading section as well. All right, so that was about it. And what about um, some code, right? So there is this particular um, you know uh, set of code that we're going to write now and it's it's kind of called cross validation okay and um, and, and don't worry too much about it um, I, I have given this link as well in the reading section but uh, it's precisely the same things that we we discussed right now right it's going to um, you know basically use some permutations and combinations of the input and then we'll pass it to the um, you know, algorithm and get some mean scores with it. All right, so let us go ahead and write some code. All right, so what we are going to do is we are going to import the cross val score module. And let me just quickly do that from sklearn dot model selection. I'm going to import the cross val score, right? And what we are going to do over here is we are going to run the k neighbors classifier, knn algorithm for say k is equal to five. So we have seen that in the in the previous lectures, right? So we 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 ran some uh, basic algorithm where we say we instantiated the class and n is equal to five, and we fit the model and done some predictions with it. So we are going to precisely do that. So let let me go ahead and um, you know do that. So let's say k n n equal to k neighbors classifier and n underscore neighbors equal to five. Okay. So I have an instance. Just make sure that I spell this correct some other issue okay 
all right that worked so we have an instance of k neighbors classifier and what we are going to do is we are going to use the cross val score and we're going to pass in k and n and see that okay for my set of inputs which is capital x and predictions or outputs that are small y um, you know run the k fold 10 times and score based on accuracy or give me the accuracy scores right and i'll store this in say scores now what this does is this is precisely what we talked about right we said that we'll for an algorithm uh, use different combinations use 10 iterations 10 iterations of different combinations of test and tr train right so use this x and y and split them into test and train um, in different com in different permutations and combinations up to 10 times and for each run give me the accuracy score right and for each run the accuracy score will be stored in scores so let's see what happens here so it ran that and if i just say print scores it's going to give me the accuracy score so the first run the accuracy score was 100 percent then it was 93 percent for the third combination it was 100 fourth to 100 so you saw that different combinations of input right different combinations of input produces different accuracy scores and this is precisely what we wanted right we if so Im imagine that uh, we took a you know the x train right we we took a, a particular uh, combination of training and test set such that you know it is similar to what it matched in number three we'll get a hundred percent uh, accuracy score and then we say that hey this this algorithm is awesome this is the most it, it is giving me hundred percent score so i'm going to go ahead and use it and when you actually run it against um, you know a few production data you'll suddenly see that the scores are going down and you'll imagine that well this was giving me hundred percent well yes that is true but for that combination of training and test set it gave you hundred but we'll have to try out for different combinations right and that's precisely what we did and we got 10 scores so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the mean score of this. So for this algorithm, based on 10 iterations, I can say that this algorithm produces approximately 97% or 96.6% accuracy. Right, so this was for k is equal to 5. Now if you remember, I had asked you to actually compute the accuracy scores for k is equal to 1 to 30. Right for um, for in the KNN algorithm, we used A is equal to number of neighbors equal to five, but you can choose number of neighbors equal to one, and then run the cross validation. Right, so for number of neighbors equal to one, we'll run it, run ten different combinations of input and get the mean score. Similarly, for number of neighbors equal to two, again ten different combinations and get the accuracy score. So basically, that is why I asked you to practice that you know looping construct but nevertheless i can kind of show you uh, quickly how it is done so what i'm going to do is first of all i'll just define a k oops sorry i'll just define a k range and what i'm going to do is i am going to run this k and n for number of neighbors 1 to 45 okay so that's that's pretty much what i'm going to do so what i'll do is um for k in k underscore range um, let's say run k neighbors classifier where n underscore neighbors equal to k so in the fight first iteration k will be equal to 1 so you'll run k n algorithm with number of neighbors equal to 1 and when it is 1 make sure that you compute the scores cross val score for the knn where n is equal to 1 for my input x y perform 10 permutations and combinations and give me the scoring accuracy right so i hope you're understanding that for nearest neighbor k nearest neighbor n is equal to 1 it will run 10 combinations of input give me the mean score then it will proceed to n is equal to 2 10 combinations of that and give me the mean score so basically what I'm doing is I'm testing this for which particular value of k right in this in this n k n n algorithm gives me the maximum accuracy right so um, and then I need to store this these values right somewhere so I'll just define an array called 
um, scores and then I'll just store it in that k underscore scores dot append and I just want to sco store the scores dot mean right all right so this ran and then let me go ahead and um, just print this Let me go ahead and print this. All right. So you saw that, um, you know, for one to 45, it is giving me all the mean scores. So when K is equal to one, it's split into 10 permutation combinations and the mean score was 95.9% accuracy. Then it was 95.3% accuracy. Then it was 96 points. So this is for K is equal to one. This is for K is equal to two. This for K is equal to three and so on and so forth, right? So for k is equal to 1 to 45, you've got all the accuracy scores now. So now it is very easy for you to choose, um, you know, what value of k can you use to um, identify the accuracy scores. And and there's actually a better way of doing it. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of like the pie, pie plot tutorial. So let me quickly show you that. So this is, I have given you the link of that as well. So it is in the matplotlib.pyplot. And that basically you can give the x axis values and y axis values and plot a nice graph over here. Right. So uh, we can we can kind of uh, in an x axis, we can plot k is equal to one to 45 and y axis, we can plot the accuracy scores and it will quickly give me, you know, a, a sort of a line and then visually we can identify which is the best algorithm. Right. So let me go ahead and do that. So the way it is done is I don't know the code by heart, but uh, import Okay, let's do this. Let's copy paste this. All right. And then um, I need to make sure that matplotlib dot pyplot as plt. Right, and I'm going to just say plot. Um, my x axis should be um your ranges that is from 0 to so from 1 to 45 and my y axis is my scores let's see if that worked uh let's see matplotlib dot pyplot it gave me an error but still it worked for some reason Ah, I know probably because of this. Hmm. Okay. So, um, you know, it kind of actually let me also make sure that I make some put some labels. Right. And this could be K value for KNN algorithm and this can be Y label this can be mean accuracy scores right so gives you all these values so looking at this you can see that for K is equal to 20 and something around 18 and 12 you get the maximum accuracy scores right and and the higher value of k uh, it's it's better so in this case we see that for our given set of inputs if we use k in an algorithm the best value of k which gives us the maximum accuracy scores is k is equal to 20 right so given x capital x and y we have now used a very very systematic method to calculate which particular algorithm gives us the maximum accuracy okay um, so i know this was a little bit of uh, too much of a deep dive i've tried to simplify this i would recommend you to uh, that you watch this lecture again uh, in order to get some idea and i would also challenge you to extend this a little bit and and we we just looked at a couple of parameter um, you know within the same algorithm 
I would challenge you to use multiple algorithms, right? Logistic regression and KNN. And uh, from that, you should be able to choose which is the best algorithm. It's just an extension of this, right? So I would challenge you to do that um, and, uh, as an assignment, as a quiz, as a homework. Um, that will help you to understand these concepts even better. So I hope you like this lecture. Um, uh, this was a little bit more deep dive. And um, in the coming few lectures, we will take a deep dive into some more complex concepts. Um, and slowly um, you will be in a position to evaluate algorithms, choose algorithms, uh, evaluate your inputs and stuff like that. All right, so see you in the next lecture. Bye. Hello everyone. So finally we are ending, we are getting to the end of this whole module on data science and analytics. So let me spend a few minutes walking you through what all we covered in the last few lectures. So first of all, we started with what is data science and analytics, right? We, we didn't assume that uh, anyone has some prior knowledge. We, we walked through some absolute basics. We looked at some concepts of data science, analytics, what it is all about, right? And then uh, we kind of went a little bit deeper into it and, and saw what is supervised and unsupervised learning. Again, just, just a little bit on just to get, get ourselves informed on that. Then we looked at the Anaconda distribution of Python and then we, we looked at some tools in which we can start typing some code. And then we kind of generalized this whole pattern, right, of how a data science algorithm really works, right? So we, we saw uh, a general framework, right, where we said that, okay, we have a set of data we kind of use some numerical and uh, numpy arrays and put it into capital X and small y and then supply it to an algorithm where it kind of studies that and then we are able to make some predictions, right? So uh, those were the few things we covered and then uh, in, in the further lectures we looked at, you know, how to kind of, um, you know, split your data into testing and training so that, um, you know, you can kind of train the data, train the um, algorithm with some data and then test it for accuracy. We saw some frameworks to calculate accuracy. We saw some ways in which we can run some loops and then uh, find the best parameters that can be used for your algorithms. Now, what exactly are the next steps? And, and just to be very clear, the idea of this was not to go to a level where you become an absolute expert in data science, but at least to give you enough idea so that you can make a choice whether data science is for you or not, right? And by this time, um, you must have realized that it's 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 frankly nothing rocket science, right? It's it's basic statistics you, that you need to learn. Uh, you need to, to learn the domain that you're working on. You need to learn how the inputs interact among each other. So you must have kind of, you know, the idea was to get a feel of what is data science and how it actually looks like when somebody says, I'm fitting a model, I'm working on a data science project, I'm a data scientist, what are they really doing, right? So again, this is like very, very high level that I have explained. So you can kind of consider this as module number one, where we just touch the surface of it, like absolute basics of data science, right? We looked at Python and stuff like that. Now, naturally, there are, there, you know, I can record more modules where I go into more complex stuff, right? Um, you know, there's something called as pandas and uh, data manipulation. Now, this is, this is basically, um, you know, I wouldn't really call this as um, pure data science, but it, it helps your data science projects a lot, right? So, it, it actually deals with how can you manipulate and clean up the input data, so most of the times you'll be given input data as, uh, you know, a CSV file or, you know, very, very huge files. And then you need to kind of clean that up. Not all the columns would be super relevant for you. And if you remember in one of the examples, we talked about the email where, you know, the email message is your input. We took that and created further inputs, right? We, we saw how many spelling errors are there, how many external links are there, um, you know, the to address, from address. So we created our own inputs. So all that input data manipulation, etc. Uh, there are some solid frameworks in Python. So uh, I can kind of even create a separate course just that deals with that. So those will be your tools towards getting to a more complex data science um, learning. 
then naturally uh, you know uh, if there is enough interest i can just create some courses on statistics right so here the idea won't be um, to get too much into coding and stuff but to kind of understand what is linear regression right in terms of equations and and you know uh, math how does it look like you know what what exactly is linear regression we'll take some um, you know sample data and kind of plot an x and y axis uh, draw some curves and and see what is the general equation that that makes it up and again if there is general interest on that i can definitely make some uh, videos towards that uh, but but then there is the second aspect of this where you kind of know enough of these algorithms so that you can go ahead in python and and kind of apply these algorithms to um uh, to your inputs right so there are lots and lots of algorithms and and it's kind of impossible to cover each and every algorithm but what we can do is we can kind of take the top 10 algorithms that are commonly used and so that you get a general understanding of you know what these algorithms do how do they interact with data and and for a certain type of data which algorithm should be even considered and given a set of five or six algorithms um, you know how can we evaluate which which algorithm works best for your given set of input data we kind of saw a little bit of that in this in this particular course but that's the whole essence of it right we will keep building up on that um, you know, and again, if there is enough interest, what we could do is uh, we could just create a course on just practical aspects, right? So there is a very um, nice website called Kaggle.com, which, um, you know, I would strongly encourage you to uh, visit that. So it's a it's basically a website which hosts data science problems, right? So a problem is posted with some sample data and you are required to solve that problem and submit it. And many people compete in this, right? And and then you're given a leaderboard as to, uh, and, and it tells you where you stand in this overall competition, right? So what we could do is we could, we could kind of take some competitions that have been closed, right? Uh, the problem still exists over there and, and, and there'll be some data sets and we can try to solve them. Uh, definitely, I cannot promise you that you know, we'll, we'll solve them so efficiently that we will be number one in the leaderboard or anything but that, but, but just, I can kind of show you that how to grab that data, um, you know, do some manipulation in, in, in that. And then, um, um, you know, uh, solve the problem. So again, um, and after that, that there, there can be a little bit more focused courses. I would say um, there is uh, something that I could create on text analytics as well. So text analytics is a huge, huge field, right? And and um, it's it's a kind of a very interesting field. Um, imagine that you are working for a large um, company, something like say American Airlines, right? And um, it's it's more of a you know B two C kind of a company where you know people purchase flight tickets and then they travel from one place to another, and the you know that and they kind of uh, that's how the company makes money. Now naturally, the, you know customer service is one of the biggest things, and then you will find that people would be leaving a lot of comments, right? Either in social media, even you know like Twitter, Facebook, on even in the American Airlines website and stuff like that. So. Naturally, um, you know these 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 big companies will have um, you know some some data science teams who would be able to kind of mine out these reviews, like these millions and millions of reviews, and kind of use some intelligent way to categorize them, right? Whether this is a good sentence, is a bad sentence, or even put it into certain categories that this this sentence belongs to something related to catering, this sentence related to something related to ticketing, things like that, right? So given a set of say 1 million sentences, you can easily, you know, um, use some algorithms and say that, hey, um, people are really complaining about say food or people are really saying nice things about our schedule, something like that, right? So um, that is where text analytics comes into play. It's, it's a very vast field, very interesting field. I have personally worked in a lot of such projects in text analytics. So um, definitely uh, if time permits, I can I can kind of create a course on that. Now, if you have been following my courses on Udemy or my website, uh, which is www.rakeshgopal.com, um, I have created a suite of courses that whole encompasses business intelligence and analytics, right? So if you are, uh, and I have written some blogs, it's, it's also on my website where I have discussed how do you really start a career or switch a career in the field of analytics, where I kind of talk about little uh, different segments, right? If you want to be a database developer and get into more of querying, 
what is expected out of you if you want to be a etl developer a little bit more on data movement and stuff like that what you should do and now um, if we are getting into analysis and and data science what you should do so accordingly i have created a few courses which which kind of um, you know covers this entire business intelligence stack um, so it's all available on udemy and my website so definitely visit my profile and you will find links to all these courses so i have some basic querying and advanced querying courses and i have some courses on integration services then uh, i recently recorded a course on reporting services and tableau and now i'll be uploading this course which is basically data science and and consider this as a module one absolute basics of it and if you like this definitely leave me a comment right and and you know what what you'd like to see in future courses and stuff like that now uh, naturally i keep writing these articles and i keep releasing a lot of new courses um, so how can you keep yourself in, informed of this? Definitely, uh, I have given up a sign up uh, link on my website. So go ahead and visit that website and, and um, you know, sign up so that um, you can kind of keep yourselves informed on these new articles and making careers in data science, analytics and stuff like that. Um, you know, definitely, um, you know, I'm available on LinkedIn and stuff. If you want, you can definitely add me. Um, um, and then all my links, social media links are present in the Udemy page as well. So, you know, those are some of the channels that you can get in touch with me. So having said all of that, uh, if you really like this course, if you like this approach, and if you, if you felt that you are gaining something out of it, I would definitely like to hear back more on this. So I would appreciate if you can leave me a review or a comment so that I at least know that what is working for you guys, what is not working for you guys, and that I can take it as a feedback. Um, you know, for my upcoming courses as well. Now, uh, in, in, in my comments and, um, you know, um, different uh, channels, uh, Udemy comments, my website comments, um, because just because of the sheer volume of, um, you know, questions that I get, uh, at times it, it takes me three to four days to get back to you guys. So, um, you know, but, but I make sure that um, I'm able to read through these comments and at least reply to the best of my ability uh, to help you guys out. So having said, uh, having said all of that, um, really appreciate your time. Uh, I hope you like this course and I wish you all the very best if you are planning to um, switch a career in data science or just refresh your skill sets in data science. Thank you very much. See you in the next course.